So the topic of my presentation is type three mitral regurgitation. I have no conflicts regarding to this topic. And in the next half an hour or so, 25 minutes or so, I would like to describe the classification and me mechanism of type three mitral regurgitation. Discuss a systematic approach for the interoperative assessment of mitral regurgitation. Also discuss a little bit of some uh, morphological changes related to chronic mitral regurgitation and also discuss and apply the last ASC 2017 guidelines in order to quantify the mitral regurgitation, type, two, type three mitral regurgitation. Okay, so our first case is a 66 years old male with a past medical history of severe aortic stenosis and also on aortic arch dilatation who presented to the hospital with severe heart failure, had a normal angiogram done last year, and also at the same time, he had a TE done that showed a, a severely dilated left ventricle with an EF of approximately 20% in a low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis. So the proposed surgery for this patient was a tissue AVR plus or minus ascending aorta and ME arch replacement. So our intraoperative TE assessment showed indeed that the patient had a really bad uh, aortic stenosis. As you can see here using the X-plane or the biplane view, we can see the, the aortic valve is pretty calcified with really poor opening. Uh, doing all the measurements, we got an uh, aortic valve error of 0.6 square centimeters and also a mean gradient uh, of 29 millimeters, probably, probably because of the low ejection fraction. So when we start doing our, our left ventricle assessment, so we also saw the, the right ventricle was pretty normal in size and normally in function as well, but the left ventricle was dilated, pretty dilated actually, with a really poor ejection fraction. Here you can see in the four chamber view and also in the transgastric view, the, the, the mid pap transgastric view, how dilated the LV is and how poor the LV function also is. When you keep moving our assessment and you keep moving the multiplane angle, we can rotate the angle to, all, to evaluate all the walls. We go to the two chamber view and also to the long axis view where, where you get the same diagnosis. And also when you look the mitral valve in the long axis view, we can see the mitral valve although, although looks normal, uh, the leaflets look, look normal, the function of the mitral valve doesn't look, doesn't look normal. So you can see the mitral valve looks a little bit restricted. The leaflet looks, the leaflets look a little bit tattered with poor um, leaflet co cooptation line. In order to improve our assessment, we put some color on, color flow doppler on, and we, and we can see now is that the patient has a, some sort of central mitral regurgitation. Probably this mitral regurgitation is related to the poor leaflet cooptation due to the leaflet restriction. So, according to Carpeggia class, uh, classification of mitral regurgitation, we have three different types of mitral regurgitation. We have type one with the le normal leaflet motion, type three, type two, sorry, with the excessive leaflet motion, and type three with the restricted leaflet motion. Type three, you can divide in type three A and type Type 3B, type 3A is the one that we have that the, the, the valve itself is diseased, which is gonna be the second case that I'm presenting today. And type, T, type 3B is the one that we have the normal leaflets itself, but something else is going on with the ventricle, probably with some sort of remodeling. When we have all the uh, subvalvular apparatus being like pulled, pull into the ventricle and the leaflet cooptation co gets a little bit, um, gets a little bit tether. And, the, and that's the reason the, why the patient start to have a mitral regurgitation. This is the case that I'm presenting now. The patient has a really big ventricle, dilated ventricle. And that's the reason why the patient uh, is he's presenting with, uh, uh, with mitral regurgitation. Following the 2017 ASC guidelines, um, we should do a like, um, integrative approach with all the different parameters in order to get a, to get a good um, assessment of the mitral regurgitation. 
We should use like a morphological assessment. We should look at the valve, see how the flip, how the, see how the leaflets are working. If there is some pathologies in the in the leaflets itself, or it's something re related with the mitral valve apparatus, which is in this case was the reason why. So we can see here the leaflets are, are really restricted in motion, especially the posterior leaflet. The leaflet coaptation line is is um, we have a really poor leaflet coaptation line, especially due to the poor uh, posterior leaflet mobility. We can also look the we can also evaluate the LV size and also the LA size, which are indirect signs of mitral regurgitation. Moving forward to the semi-quantitative, qualitative, and quantitative assessment of the mitral valve, we can use the color flow in order to identify the mitral regurgitant jet and also with the color flow we can also if possible we can if we can align the whole jet we can also measure the vena contractor width and also we can evaluate the flow regurgitant area well of the mitral valve of the mitral regurgitation of the mitral regurgitation we can also use the, the like i said the vena contractor width which is going which is pretty much the true orifice of the mitral regurgitant um, lesion and also we should also we can also measure the we can also measure the post wave doppler in the pulmonic vein in order to get a good sense of how the receiving chamber is coping is dealing with the the, the excessive volume that is like is being pushed forward to the left atrium so when you have a um, systolic flow reversal in the pulmonary vein is really specific for severe mitral regurgitation in, in about 80 85% of the cases so when you move to the quantitative approach, you can use the um, PISA method to, to measure the uh, EROA and also the, uh, measure the um, regurgitant volume and regurgitant fraction in order to get a better sense of how bad or how, how bad is the severity of the mitral regurgitation. For our patient using the, uh, the PISA assessment, we are able to measure an EROA of 0.3 centimeters square and also a regurgitant volume of 35 um, cc's, which puts the patient in um, using all the uh, integrative approach that the 2017 guidelines present, put the patient in the moderate range of mitral regurgitation, more towards the grade two mitral regurgitation um, value than the grade three. So, we, if we put all the parameters that I just said, we can like, I'm, I'm, I'm showing you that the patient had a dilated LV size, dilated LA size. We had, he had a vena contractor width of 0.4. He had systolic blunting of the pulmonary vein flow. He had an IROA of 0.3 and a regurgitant volume of 34 cc's. So the patient ended up getting a, a biobento he had also ascending, uh, an ascending MER to reconstruction. And what they found was that the, the aortic valve was, was bicuspid with uh, left and right fusion. So here is the patient coming off bypass on a lot of inotropic support. You can see, you see now the new valve in place. You can see the, the mitral valve leaflets are opening and closing a little bit better. The patient is hyperdynamic on, at, this, at this point coming off by pass on 10 mics of dog. We, we still a little bit of mitral regurgitation and the follow-up echo on this patient two weeks after the surgery showed a marginal improvement in the LV function. Uh, it was 10 or 15% before, now it's 25% with no paravalvular regurgitation and tracing mitral regurgitation and normal RV function. So this was to illustrate uh, a type 3B Carpentier classification of mitral regurgitation. Type 3B is related to the, the valve itself is normal. What is happening is the LV for some reason is dilated. There is some remodeling that is like, it's like pulling back the, all the sub, sub, uh, subvalvular apparatus making, um, making the cause for the, the mitral regurgitation. Moving forward to our second case, our second case is a 65 years old female uh, with a 148 centimeters height and 92 kilos with a really complex history. She has a history of a chronic AFib, 
with a normal LV function, some sort of um, diastolic dysfunction. She also has a history of rheumatical mitral stenosis. The mitral stenosis was assessed a few years before, but because of the patient's severe obesity, they declined the surgery on this lady. Also a history of a SACG and hypothyroidism. At this time, she presented to the hospital with an um, exacerbation of heart failure, rapid AFib that needs some assessment, that needs some sort of treatment now. So the transthoracic um, examination showed a severely dilated LF atrium, moderately dilated right atrium, uh, normal RV and RV size and function. And she also had a severe mitral stenosis due to rheumatic disease with a mean grade of 20 millimeters of mercury with a mitral valve area estimated in 1.3 square centimeters and also some moderate mitral regurgitation. So the patient had proposed a mitral valve replacement, also a maze procedure, and also isolation of late left atrial appendix due to uh, chronic atrial fibrillation. So we start doing our intra opt assessment. We can see in the four chamber view, the biventricular function is normal. We can appreciate the, the size of the left atrium, which was really big. We can also see the right atrium was also enlarged. And we cannot appreciate in the four chamber view, at least in this picture, uh, the, the mitral valve like uh, the way you should assess it. We also can see the transgastric, uh, the, the, the mid-pub transgastric view. We can see the, the normal biventricular function. When you start moving with uh, our um, multiplane assessment, we start moving and change all the walls and all the mitral valve assessment. We can appreciate the size the, the, of the left atrium. And especially on the long axis view, we can see some features related to the mitral stenosis due to rheumatic mitral valve disease, due, due to rheumatic disease. We can see both leaflets are really thickened. The mobility of both leaflets are really restricted, but, but especially the, the posterior leaflet is not moving. The anterior leaflet has some sort of um, appearance of a hockey stick appearance in the, in, in the diastolic frame. So this is pretty, uh, it's pretty specific for rheumatic mitral valve disease. When you go to the 3G assessment of the mitral valve using the zoom module and uh, looking from the atrial perspective, we can see the mitral valve in the center of the screen. We can see the arch valve on the top of the screen at 12 hours, and you can see the poor opening and the poor opening of the of both of both leaflets with, uh, uh, due to the rheumatic disease. Talking a little bit about uh, zoom mode that I we are using to get this picture is a really good modality for real time 3G or and also multi bit acquisition. It allows us to, uh, enables us to focus on a specific, a specific 3D image and a specific, a specific volume. It's really good for evaluating valve and specific areas of the heart, especially valve and um, interictal septum procedures. It allows us to have a, good, a really good understanding and live um, understanding of really hap what, what's really happening in procedures in real time. But also in order to get a good, like a really good picture of the 3D zoom mode, we should like it, have in mind some tips in order to maximize and optimize those, those, those frames and those pictures. So in order to maximize the frame rate, in order to maximize the temporal resolution, we should also like focus in our assessment in one specific uh, structure. Um, before that, we should, have a, we should have a really good assessment of the 2D picture. We should get a really good 2D picture of the, in, the structure that we are like trying to Im image. We don't have, there is no way you can have a really good 3D picture without a, two, a good 2D, 2D picture and assessment. After we get the 2D, the 2D picture and we do the assessment, we should change the focus to the uh, structure of interest and also trying to get the, the region of interest or region of um, the, 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 the area that we're trying to measure the, the smaller as possible in order to get the, the best frame rate. 
and also in order to make the temporal resolution better and sometimes the spatial resolution better, we can change from the live 3G mode to the multi-bit acquisition. So this is going to improve also our temporal and um, spatial resolution. So going, um, and also you can use the, the MPR, the multiple reformatting, which you can like um, cross all the three different axes, the, uh, the X, the Y, and the Z axis in order to slice the valve exactly the point that we are trying to see. And it can show us exactly where the, the disease of the valve is. In this example, I'm, I, 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 I took this example because using the multiplanar reconstruction, we can have a really good assessment of the, the disease, the P3 disease on this valve. Going back to our patient, continue with the, uh, with the, the mitral valve assessment, put some color on the mitral valve. You can see that is a really, really good, like a really severity mitral stenosis on this patient. We can see the flow acceleration in diastole. But also we, when, you good, a good, when you get a good frame, we can see also there is some sort of mitral regurgitation. This patient, this patient has a mixed, mixed valve lesion. She has some sort of, she has a really bad actually mitral stenosis and also some sort of mitral regurgitation. In order to quantify this mitral regurgitation, first, uh, before that, um, this patient, because of the mitral, the mitral stenosis, the mitral valve is restricted due to like thickening, due to the rheumatic calcification. This patient is a type 3A carpe -A classification. The first example that I gave was a type 3B classification, which was related to LV dilatation to do some remodeling. And this patient has a type 3A uh, mitral regurgitation due to restricted um, mobility of the leaflets due to the thickening uh, caused by the rheumatic disease. Using the 2017 uh, severity assessment guidelines, we should like try to integrate all the, the information that we get with, the, with the, the GE assessment. So for this patient, we have a really thick anemo bio mitral valve leaflets. We also have a really big, really dilated left atrium. Using the quantitative, semi-quantitative and qualitative assessment of the mitral valve, we can, have, we can see uh, we, we are able to get a vena contract in this patient of 0.5 centimeters calculating the, the, the EROA and the P, by PISA method, we had a really good as, um, assessment of the, of the PISA radio. We were able to get a regurgitant volume of 34 cc, 34 millimeters, which put, would put the, this patient in the same range as the patient before in the moderate range of, moderate range of mitral regurgitation. She had a, like a pretty bad disease in the mitral leaf. It's pretty restricted, asset, pretty restricted leaflet mobility. She had a really, really big left atrium. She had a variable um, color jet area. Um, she also had a 0.4.5 vena contract width with an EROA of 0.3 and a regurgitant volume of, of 34 uh, cc's. So this patient ended up getting a, a tissue valve. She also had a, a maze procedure and also pulmonary vein isolation. She came off bypass on some support. So this is the, the long axis view of the mitral valve post, post replacement. She, got, she had a tissue, tissue mitral valve. The mitral valve, the, the prosthesis looks fine. Both leaflets are opening and closing well. We don't see any degree of mitral regurgitation anymore. When you calculate the gradient across this valve was below five millimeter, millimeters of mercury. And when you did the 3D assessment of the mitral valve, looking, at the, looking from the left atrial side, we could see the mitral valve in the in unfast view, opening and closing wells, the leaflets opening and closing wells. And um, I would like to like to find out to end this presentation with, with a few key, key points. First of all, we should like uh, do an integrate as, uh, integrate approach of all the multi, uh, different parameters in order to have a more accurate assess of mitral regurgitation severity. There is no single Doppler or single 2G modality 
that is uh, precise enough to quantify the severity of mitral regurgitation in individual patients. So we should always try to get some quantitative assessment of mitral regurgitation severity, especially when the diagnosis of a mild or severe mitral regurgitation is not that clear. And we also should have in mind that when we, use, when we are using color for Doppler, we can we can we are going to discuss this in the afternoon with the uh, on the questions. Uh, having we, we should always have in mind that using color for Doppler for mitral valve assessment. Uh, can be very, very um, um, can be can be very misleading because sometimes, although the patient has a really like um, um, small jet area, for example, eccentric jet that goes and uh, hugs the the wall area, the wall vent, the wall atrium area, the, this patient may have some sort of moderate or severe mitral regurgitation. When you use a colorful Doppler to assess mitral regurgitation, colorful colorful um, color flow is really important to identify the jet. But we should, we should de-emphasize the importance of color flow Doppler only. We should pay attention to the vena contractor width, which is much more specific for mitral regurgitation. And we all should have a good like uh, understanding of the regurgitant flow and the conver convergence area in order to have a bit really good access of uh, really good assessment of the mitral regurgitation. Um, I'm gonna stop it there uh, if you have any questions and uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Fabio, for the amazing presentation. Uh, back to back to back, great presentations. Uh, does anybody have any questions for uh, uh, Fabio? Well, I I'll ask you a question. Uh, with, in that first case, if you have a patient with sev severe aortic stenosis and a functional MR, when do you decide? When do you decide to uh, actually do something to the mitral valve? Actually, replace it. Sorry, sorry, Chris, could you repeat? I, 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 sorry, I'm sorry about that. So, the patient with severe AS and concomitant uh, functional MR, and you're going to move from, and you're doing a, uh, and it gets more difficult to deal with the MR after the aortic valve replacement. When do you decide to intervene on the mitral valve? Well, that's a, that's a good question. So, it's hard to tell. Uh, we should like um, have a, like a patient asset, a ba um, we should like, do a, um, a really thorough assessment on the patient. So for our patient, so we, did, we are not expecting to have this, this sort of mitral regurgitation beforehand because the transthoracic echo didn't show that. So when we put the, trans, the transophageal echo and we saw the echo, and we saw the picture, so we did a, uh, an assessment because the surgeon was asking us, should we change this mitral valve? Should we do something in this mitral valve or not? So this patient, she had a, she, he had, sorry, he had a mild, like a more towards the mild regurgitation, mild to moderate regurgitation. So the patient and end up not doing anything on this valve because he said, oh, we are gonna change the, the aortic valve. So probably this, this is gonna um, allow the left ventricle to remodeling and to get better. Hopefully the mitral, mitral regurgitation is gonna go away in a few weeks. And that was exactly what happened. But for patients with uh, like a, some sort of more than moderate mitral regurgitation is, is a hard assessment. So we should like um, have like a see patient by patient, see what they, they do. Normally here at the hospital, they, they try not to touch the mitral valve unless the valve, the valve has some sort of organic disease. If it's functional, and it is caused by probably uh, severe aortic stenosis, they, they tend to just touch the aortic valve and let the mitral valve alone. And in hoping that the mitral, the, the left ventricle is gonna remodel and it's gonna get better and the degree of mitral regurgitation is gonna improve. 